qualify, you have to put $10 in the donation box. <laughs> Good time to silence your phones. I uh, want to start with a shout out to our North Carolina Marine Mammal Stranding Network. As recently as yesterday, we get the calls of dead, dying, entangled marine mammals in North Carolina. It can be one of many species of whales. It could be one of four species of seal. It could be manatees. Um, and these are the organizations that take a leadership role. And that's where uh, this story will begin. Uh, these are the topics I'm going to cover pretty briefly about this project. Um, a little bit about sperm whales and from the stranding to the skeletal display. So thank you, Mark. Mark's in the audience. We are zooming to Arizona and others because of his generosity. I appreciate that. Okay. Cetacea or cetaceans, it's a taxonomic term that refers to all whales, dolphins, and porpoises. This poster represents all known cetaceans known to science on Earth as of about five years ago when this was published. All the baleen whales, the whales that lack teeth, are facing away from me. You are passing around baleen from a humpback whale. That's a baleen whale. All the tooth whales are facing toward me. If you spend much time around here, you will likely see a bottlenose dolphin, technically a small tooth whale. I don't care if you correct the person on the beach next to you who says, oh, look at the porpoises, but what you are seeing are bottlenose dolphins. Um, I've circled all the cetacean species we have documented in North Carolina. This isn't competition, I'm not bragging, but that's more than any other state. And it's not because we have the biggest coastline, we don't. It's not because we have the best biologists, we don't. Um, and, and there's just a lot of whale diversity. I don't wanna leave people to believe, go to North Carolina and see all these whales. This includes the really rare ones as well. But uh, in this presentation, all I'm gonna speak about is the largest of the tooth whales, sperm whale. Just to orient you, uh, kind of highlighted the three major points or capes that uh, are featured along the coast of North Carolina. And you can see the continental shelf edges as well. It's a terrific photo. Uh, and then the next picture is going to be the same area, land and water, but sea surface temperature. And you might have heard of the Gulf Stream bringing warm water up from the tropics. And the Labrador Current Extension, which is in blue, bringing cool water down from the polar regions. And those warm and cool water currents intersect close to shore right off North Carolina. So the continental shelf edge is close to shore, and that confluence of currents close to shore, I really believe, contributes to our diversity. Sperm whale distribution globally. This is a, a slight oversimplification, but it, it's quite accurate, actually. Uh, males, females, and young are restricted to the temperate tropical waters in gray. Only the mature males tend to wander toward the poles. So if sperm whale were seen like in New Jersey or Massachusetts, uh, with confidence, I would say it's a male because only males go up there. Young, the females, stay in the temperate tropical waters as depicted here. We are right there where the star is. So we see large males and females with young because we're in that range. This is a, we, you would not see a healthy sperm whale close to shore. Their habitat is way offshore. They're very deep down. This is a, Presumed mom with their newborn sperm whale that we saw offshore. So that's mom's dorsal fin. That's the baby's dorsal fin, just a little dorsal hump. Mom's head is about here. Baby's head is about there. Uh, just stayed long enough to snap a picture. This was, I couldn't believe we saw this. It, it, this, this baby probably wasn't weeks old. 
Um, and I wanted to use this to just highlight a few things about reproduction. In sperm whales, as far as we know, uh, females mature around nine years, males around 19 years. Slow to mature those males, but in females too. A long gestation period, 15 to 16 months. Calving interval, one newborn every five to 14 years. That calving interval seems to extend as the female ages. But again, these are really hard data to get. So uh, this is a little bit of uh, speculation. Age at weaning approximates the calving interval. And my whole point I want to make about all this is that they have a really low reproductive rate. And this was the species that was targeted globally to the brink of extinctions in many parts of its range. If they recover, we will it'll take a long time for us to even detect it because the reproductive rate is so low. Longevity, 60 to 70 years, but the pigeons we just aren't sure. Okay, so that was a mom and a newborn, and the fisherman on my boat back there said, oh, let's get some squid. And I said, how are you going to get squid? He said, oh, everyone knows if you see a nursery group of sperm whales, you get large squid. Well, I didn't know that. And they put their squid jigs overboard, and they caught a whole bunch of squid that size. To me, that's a huge squid. The sperm whale, maybe not. Um, and squid is their primary diet. So it's really neat to have the fishermen uh, educate me in that way. And we ate that huge squid rings in calamari. And the next slide is going to show you the beak, the hard part, the mouth of this squid. And that's it. So that's uh, about two inches. No, not huge. And you cannot tell the size of a squid by the size of the beak, apparently. But anyway, uh, I mentioned hunted globally and relentlessly, and this is uh, eventually how it was done. Uh, no, actually it was done by steamships eventually, but this is a sailing mothership that launches some whale boats to put harpoons in a scared, powerful, pissed off animal. And of course we didn't have cell phones back then, so you got a lot of paintings to depict it. This graph is the only graph I'm gonna show and I got it from Hal Whitehead's book, which is right here. Actually, I'm going to put these really relevant. Uh, and the bottom axis is about 200 years. The vertical axis is um, in the thousands, how many sperm whales were killed in whaling globally. I think anyone who's seen this agrees that this is a way underestimate. But the thing I wanted to show you was the trend that what might have been considered sustainable was the open boat hunt. This is small boats leaving shore, killing a whale, dragging it to shore, and processing it. Um, but when oil was discovered in Pennsylvania, that was a much easier way to get lubricants, heat, light. It was cheaper, too. So there was a decrease in the demand, including the kills, of sperm whales. And then the development of exploding harpoons, factory ships that could actually kill a whale, process it, kill another whale, process it, and store all that oil on board, because they were primarily after oil. Um, that proliferated in the early 1900s. Then there was a, a moratorium on whaling in the 60s, the Endangered Species Act, and the Marine Mammal Protection Act in our country. Uh, but that was after, like, we became very efficient in killing them. So what's left on Earth is pretty much a remnant population in many parts of their range. I got this from the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and I, it's not important that you see the colors or distinguish the dots. I just want to use this to emphasize off of North Carolina was a destination. Each one of these dots, the open ones, the colored ones, they represent a recorded sperm whale kill. Curious, you know, how accurate it is, but it was an honest attempt to document that. And it's just the location I want to emphasize, which is right off North Carolina. I am pleased to tell you 
that if I go get a continental shelf edge any day, summer, winter, weekend, holiday, <laughs> if I don't see sperm whales, I can hear them with my hydrophone. So if I don't, if I go out there and I don't see them, I have an underwater microphone and you can hear them. So that's just a bit of optimism to me. They are there. And the ones I see generally are um, presumed moms and they're, and they're young. So hopefully they're recovering. They have the biggest nose on earth. And as far as we know, they can't smell a thing. <laughs> I cannot think of an animal whose skull does such a poor job at representing the shape of the head. Most of that head is not skeletal. It's filled a lot of plumbing, blood and air, and the uses for the whale, we're still confused about, but we believe that that has a primary purpose of sound production, manipulation, propagation. It's filled with spring setting, which is a very valuable oil to whalers in this country. And sperm whales have the biggest brain on earth. They're not the biggest animal on earth, but they do have the biggest brain on earth. The lava lamp. That is there in case this presentation is so painfully boring, you can at least be entertained. <laughs> no, <laughs> if I forget to tell you why I have a lava lamp there, someone please say, hey, Keith, what's up with the lava lamp? If I remember. <laughs> um, and we're not putting harpoons on in them anymore, but we are managing to kill them. And this is an entangled sperm whale. Uh, you don't have to be a scientist to figure out what was torturing it. Interesting thing about sperm whales. Actually, it's more interesting. This is a characteristic of all deep diving whales. What's a deep diving whale? Sperm whale and beaked, B-E-A-K-E-D, whales. Those are deep diving whales. They only have teeth in the lower jaw. Huh? What's a shallow diving whale? Dolphins and baleen whales. Baleen whales don't have teeth. Dolphins have teeth in both upper and lower jaw. So this just shows sperm whale, teeth only in the lower jaw. And actually in this species, not, not in the beaked whales, but in this species, they have sockets in the upper jaw that receive the teeth. Uh, this is a well-heeled ship strike victim. It's facing that way. That's its dorsal hump or fin. Its head is right there. So often they're lethal and they aren't well healed. And then the upper one is a whale that came ashore, Point Reyes, California, and its stomach was filled with trash, fishing netting and other trash. So um, I want to bring your attention to another book that was just published called We Are All Whalers by Michael Moore who's probably investigated more whale deaths from whaling and from human, other human policy, like entanglement ship strikes. And he makes the case that our Nikes from China and our seafood from Norway and so on is responsible for not just the deaths of more whales than whalers today, but a less humane and more indiscriminate death of whales. This is a terrific book, very interesting. Uh, another reason to be terrified. <laughs> This is a North Carolina case, a deep diver, a sperm whale. Again, teeth in the lower jaw only. There's sockets in the upper jaw. You can barely see a couple of the sockets. And she was really skinny, she's a young female. The next slide is gonna show you her entire stomach content. She came ashore in Avon, North Carolina, alive and died on the beach. And um, you, you don't have to be a scientist to figure out what killed this whale. She did have about two liters of squid beaks in her stomach, which is what we like to see, indicating she'd eaten, I don't know how recently, but the esophagus it was this jam-packed plastic, this stuff, nothing could pass. And so she started that. Um, and there's a plastic bags, plastic film, rope of various sizes, diameter. This is a, an air bladder, sort of thing you might put in your kayak for buoyancy. And this is a big mystery to me because an important point I want to make is we're finding more plastic more of the time in deep divers like this than in shallow divers. And that's an oh wow to me. I didn't see that coming. Uh, so we have a lot to learn. Okay, going to bring you home the Cape 
look out in Beaufort, and where I have that square uh, is where we're going to spend the rest of this talk. <laughs> at the southern tip of Cape Lookout. And I want to pause and just see if I can address a couple questions at this point, if anyone has. Again, I'll stay longer, yes. When you say the sperm whales were offshore, can you please define in miles or nautical miles, what is offshore to you? Or to 12 to 15 miles off of Hatteras, 20 to 25 miles off of here, generally along the continental shelf edge. Great question, thank you, Brown. Uh, online audience, the question was, what is offshore? I mentioned they are an offshore species. So um, tens of miles from shore, depending on where you are in North Carolina. Did that help? Absolutely. All right, thanks. Yes. Thank What's the continental ledge? Um, like just pretty much just what I told him. So it's 12-ish uh, to 15 miles off of Hatteras, 20 to 25 miles. Up of here, if anyone knows better, speak up. But I think that's about right. So it's um, and in my, the early map I showed, there were two features offshore. There was were two continental, two drop offs, and they converge off North Carolina into one. Um, but anyway, so it depends whether you know tens of miles offshore. And there's one more question. Yeah. They've had all these whales come up on the beach up in Jersey. And when did you read, or why don't they found two whales? Um, in the three necropsy reports, I either read or got a summary of um, ship strike was the cause of the stranding. Um, but the terms that the veterinarians I work with are using more and more is cumulative impacts. We all want to know the smoking gun. What killed this whale? But as in human health, in whale health too, it's just hard to figure out the cumulative impacts. And when I ask what was the cause of death, one of these bright veterinarians once told me, Keith, you're asking the wrong question. You should ask what was the cause of the stranding? Because if a, if a dying whale comes ashore with entangled in a net and they euthanize it, what's the cause of death? Euthanasia. Um, so those are mostly humpbacks, uh, not all of them were investigated, and it takes a while to get the tissue samples back, but the three that I'm, I'm aware of were ship strikes. I'm not saying there weren't any contributing factors um, in addition to ship strikes. Thanks for asking. Did I interrupt you? No. No, okay. okay. Cool. All right, how we go? Uh, so in this picture, the southern tip of Cape Lookout, Cape Lookout Bight, Power Squadron Spit, Upper right is Harker's Island. Got to just to orient you. That long island that goes across the whole slide is Shackleford Banks. And where that arrow is pointing is where a report directed me on a very cold January day that a fisherman reported a live sperm whale on the beach. And this is it. And by the time me and my volunteers got there, it was very fresh dead. Again, teeth only in the lower jaw. This big bulge is not the brain, it's not the cranium, it's that huge spermaceti organ with all the oil um, and other tissues in it. Another picture of it. So this is that fresh dead whale. Uh, good look at the blowhole here. And uh, my friend Annie is taking a tooth out. It was important to get a tooth out because we wanted to use it to estimate age. Most tooth whales, and all the ones I've examined, have growth layers in the teeth, like greens in a tree. So with that tooth that she pulled out, I was able to cut it lengthwise, etch it with formic acid, stain it with ink, and it revealed lines. That's what I was hoping for. And it enabled me to estimate that this was a 15-year-old male sperm whale when it came to door and died at Cape Lookout. The necropsy team, uh, heads up, a few gory pictures coming up, but this necropsy team, uh, veterinarians, biologists, volunteers, super dedicated. They take more measurements than you can imagine are possible. And uh, they, they weigh things and then they cut into it 
to learn about perhaps what tortured this animal or what it was eating. So this is how a necropsy works in a large whale. We can't move them to a lab, so we do it on the beach. Bruce is cutting off the left flipper, the left pectoral fin, also called flipper. I'll tell you about that, long story about that. Uh, John's holding the ribs apart so veterinarian Dr. Paul Nader can get the heart out of the whale because for some reason, he thought the heart might be valuable and worth study. I'm back there with a green vest on, so excited because I have finally found something I've been looking for, spermaceti from home sperm whale. Um, oops. That's the heart out of that whale. And I'll just spoil it now because I can't keep secrets. This is what is on display, plastinated underneath the whale skeleton from which it came. And that's what I was so excited about, uh, spermaceti, which is literally this. If you're feeling adventurous, you're welcome to come up and smell it. You can touch it if you want. But this, I mean, every one of your grandparents depended on this. This was the smell of money and security, lighting, heating, Lubrication, Rolls Royce transmission fluid, lots of things. And that's it flowing out of the head. And I yelled for volunteers to get buckets because I wanted to figure out how much was in there. And so they got buckets, but most of it fell in the sand and I didn't. I collected about three gallons, but I think there were more like 20 gallons in there. I know it's a lot. Uh, lighting and heating and many other uses. Uh, the woman I met used to work for Mitsubishi. She says recently as the 1960s, uh, the motor oil that went in Mitsubishi had sperm study. So I thought that was, whoa, that's kind of recent to me. <laughs> and just a few other uh, products that none of you are old enough to recognize these. Let's just settle that. <laughs> okay. We think the world of a deep diver is sound much like ours is vision. They have an elaborate way of producing sound, an elaborate way of receiving it. And what goes on in that brain, we pretty much are just beginning to make educated guesses. Communication, navigation, finding prey, avoiding predators, possibly making a sound so powerful, so intense that it could kill and stun a fish or a squid. So, I spent some time offshore with some acousticians. And every night, I was the daytime guy. I would look for whales. This is my job. And at night, they would wake up, these people who study acoustics, and they would start listening. And the boat would slow down. And before I went to bed every night, I would go to the acoustics lab and ask for a bedtime story. It was the bedtime story, invariably, could have been other things, but it was certainly sperm whale sounds. And this is a clip of those sounds. Um, whalers used to call them the carpenter fish. We can ignore for now the fact that they aren't fish, but the point is that the sounds to the whalers sounded like hitting a nail with a hammer. If you're expecting repeating a lot of humpback whale songs, you're going to be very disappointed. Let's see if this works. Yes. Have we figured out how that sound is created? Um, some people think it's created by not from vocal cords, but by squishing air back and forth. The question was, have they figured out how the sound is created? Um, from bottomless dolphin studies, um, researchers have a fair idea. Most of the sound that they use is created. I'm squishing air under my tongue. That sounds like a dolphin. Um, and there's lots of air sacs, but it's really hard to figure out. It's a good question. Um, so a lot of people are working on it. But what the sound mean, that's your job. And it's due Monday. Please translate it to English. <laughs> uh, we don't know what they're saying, but we think it's really important. The stomach of our whale, that's the entire stomach contents. Uh, this is normal and natural and what we like to see. Parasitic worms are not unusual. 
veterinarians did not think they had anything to do with the health of the death of the whale. And the cause of death or the cause of the stranding of that whale was undetermined. That's not unusual. And squid beaks, lots of squid beaks. And I brought all that stomach contents back here, strained them out, put them in a jar. And I had a group in here and I was showing it to the group and some people from UNC Wilmington said, Keith, can we analyze that for you? And I said, sure, whatever that means. Yeah, because I trust it. So Ryan and Michelle took the entire stomach contents, identified all of the squid beaks, two species, and made a reference collection. There it is. And I thought I would never see the results or the stomach contents again. And, uh, and this is the most common species. About 500 some of those were represented in the stomach contents and in the beaks that I showed you a picture of. And a summary was shocking to me, 600 individual prey items, 19 different species of squid. Huh? I, I, like, I didn't know there were that many on Earth. Uh, and one species of octopus represented by the beaks in the stomach of that whale. Two of the species of squid, they told me, uh, were, had never been documented in the North Atlantic Ocean. Just, they, they have only been documented around Hawaii. Huh? Like, did our whale swim to Hawaii? Or is Hawaii just a place people like to go to study squid? I don't know, a lot of questions. Uh, the hyoid bones, that top bone in your throat, that wiggles around when you wiggle your tongue. That's your hyoid bone. And these are the uh, hyoid bones inside the throat of this fresh, dead sperm whale. Lunchtime. <laughs> Lunchtime. <laughs> um, and at some point, a veterinarian turned to me and said, Keith, um, where do you want to put the bones? And I said, we're just doing a necropsy here. I'm not saving any bones. He goes, you're crazy. This is like an endangered species. A great necropsy was done. You had the whole thing. Beaufort was a whaling community. And you're not saving these bones? Anyway, he talked me into it. And so uh, we couldn't move it, of course. So we had to cut the head off. And, cut a lot more stuff off and we couldn't do it in two or three days. So I put a sign up to try to protect all the bones. Eventually we got the head away from the tail and, and, and the park service brought a backhoe out there and it dug a big hole and I put nylon mesh at the bottom of the hole and wrapped the whale in nylon mesh. I didn't want to lose any bones. And we dragged the head and we dragged the tail and we dumped it into the grave, covered it up for four years. Checked on it pretty regularly. This was an experiment. I just had no options. I couldn't think of anything else. Um, four years later, got a big team together. Uh-oh, Jim put on a mask. It might be getting stinky. And yes, it was quite stinky because um, the flesh was mostly gone, but the oil was still in the sand and the oil got quite stinky. And this was the haul from that day. We couldn't get it all. We wanted to be careful. One rack of ribs, one side, the two scapular damage. This is one flipper, the sternum and so on. So anyway, that's how we exhumed the whale. I showed you a picture of the hyoid bones out of the fresh dead whale after four years in a grave. A little stinky, but um, fresh, flesh free. That's what I was after. Some of the vertebrae. <laughs> and uh, the skull wasn't quite ready. So the following year, we went back with a backhoe and lifted the uh, upper jaws and the skull, the cranium, off the lower jaws. Now you're looking at the palate, the roof of the mouth of the whale, the bone, and there was still a lot of flesh attached. So we still had work to do. Um, and this is a picture of the uh, upper jaws and skull. And there's some damage, it's very fragile up there. But Elizabeth who's standing there, I uh, love cross uh, jigsaw puzzles. She said, Keith, I got this. Just save all the fragments in a bucket. I got this, and she did. Uh, everything went wrong that day. The weather turned to crap. The four-wheel drive Mitsubishi died, so I had to get the backhoe to tow the Mitsubishi 
the first trailer broke under the weight of the skull, so we had to go to Harker's Island, get another trailer out there. Finally, we got the whole skull on the trailer to the old Coast Guard dock in Cape Lookout, and the Park Service brought a boat out with a crane, and we lifted that whole thing on a crane. Uh, we built a pond at the museum's Gallant Channel property. I think I can talk about it now. Because <laughs> it was very stinky during the hot summer months. Uh, and we wanted uh, anaerobic gut bacteria from horse manure to eat the rest of the flesh off the skulls. It's called maceration. And so we built the pond, put the skull in. I went to the Laurel Farm Road stables and got 15 gallons of fresh horse poop, dumped it in the pond. And that's where it sat for nine stinky months to get the flesh off and that worked beautifully. Meanwhile, when the skull was in the pond, uh, Adrian, a teacher, and Angela, a student, wanted to help him. I didn't really know what to tell him to do, but I was advised to not put real teeth in the display because people would try to steal them. And so I asked them to make replica teeth. That's what I'm wearing. That's what they're making. They made a mold of each tooth and then they pour resin in the mold. And after 10 minutes, the resin hardens. And there is one of the 42 teeth represented by the replica. That was Angela's final project for her biology class. And those are the actual teeth. So you can't tell that they're fake because another volunteer painted them to look like the original teeth. So. While the skulls in the pond, we laid out all the bones. We weighed them for some strange reason, because that's what a geeky scientist does, I guess. Uh, and the results of the weighing is fascinating. Every right rib is heavier than the corresponding left rib. Every bone in the right flipper is a little heavier than the corresponding bone in the left flipper. Huh? I called up other people who put sperm whales together and asked them if, what, does this make sense to them? They said, I don't know, I didn't weigh our bones. <laughs> so we're starting to pay attention to um, the asymmetry in, in their skeleton, but also in their behavior. The adventures of a left flipper. So when we were doing that necropsy, one of the veterinarians said, Keith, can I borrow one of these flippers? And I said, I'm not in charge here, why? And who are you? <laughs> and he said, well, I'm Paul Nader and I've built two sperm whale skeletons and we've never gotten the flippers right. But now I have access to an X-ray machine and you can get it correct anatomically with five digits. I said, sure. And so I loaned him the um, flipper and he X-rayed it and that's it. And it's an oh wow to a lot of us when we see that it has the same bones that we have in our arm. Uh, humerus, ulna, radius, upper arm bones, one, two, three, four, five digits. The last two digits are slightly fused in this one. Uh, and a, you know, an x-ray of a human uh, arm. I volunteered uh, Bruce and Pudge, literally put the flipper bones on the x-ray life-size to build the flipper of the whale. So we're very excited about the level of accuracy we can achieve. And my good friend and volunteer, John Russell, thought that was so cool. He said, Keith, you made replicas of the teeth. Can I make replicas of the flipper bones? Because in his career, he was a chemist. And so he thought he could do it. He knew he could do it. And so I said, sure. And so he made silicone molds of every bone in the left flipper that was x-rayed. And so that shows you um, there's a little parallax over there, but the original ulna and the replicant ulna, I mean, I can't tell them apart. Um, and the result was he built a flipper out of replicas, and this is literally what he's holding. I'm so great and proud of the work. Um, yeah. You know, I was so keeping the camera, packing around, and uh, he made another set so that people can actually have those bones and build a flipper based on the x ray, based on that. Shout out to John Russell. Uh, in the next five or six slides, I'm just going to go through briefly. We literally had to build a facility to build this well. Uh, and one supporter raised his hand and said, I've got some land. Another one says, I'm a builder. And they literally built a barn 
custom made to build a whale. So this is day one, day two, day three, it's a 20 by 40 foot pole barn. Day four, put in the windows, lay in the roof, my roofing divas. <laughs> Final coat of paint, this is day six or seven, pouring the concrete floor. And the result was um, a 20 by 40 foot building uh, to build this whale. A strength and center beam so that we could actually have the strength to display it in there before we actually brought it here. While we were doing the building, uh, I sent all the bones to the NC State Vet School and they ran them through a trichloroethylene vapor degreaser. Whale bones are really greasy. This is a small museum. I would have been in trouble if I hung a stinky, dripping <laughs> whale skeleton. So we paid an extra $8,000 to have them degrease all the bones. And then Jim is soaking all the bones in hydrogen peroxide to further kill bacteria and dissolve any little flesh that might be on the bones. Uh, volunteer build a rack so that we can keep it organized and dry them. Nelson and Brooks are painting all the bones in a product called J403. It's book binding glue. Librarians swear by it. <laughs> we diluted it 50 50 with water, and all the bones are coated with this two coats to keep them, the bones from deteriorating, getting chalky over time, and it makes it less attractive to dust. And it seems to be working. Josh is drilling a hole so that he can pin every vertebra in the spine of the whale to its neighbor so that the vertebrae won't twist out of shape or flip over or something like that. David is making a surgical cut here. Um, this is where the atlas and axis, the top two vertebrae, um, touch the skull. And so that the steel pipe that you don't see in the display, because we made a big effort to not let you see that, but this is what supports that skeleton. And my welder buddy Dennis made these little Mickey Mouse things, custom made, so that he could attach a cable here, but you really wouldn't see the support mechanism. So you, you, don't, you don't see these supports in the display. Uh, putting together the hyoid bones. That's the welder Dennis building the framework for the rib cage. Mary is painting the book binding blue mixture to the bottom of the skull. Karen is painting every tooth to look like the original. Not just painting them all brown, literally painting every tooth to look like the original. Uh, she's putting the final touches on one of the flippers, uh, the left one. And then we had a little, <laughs> Parade downtown Beaufort, <laughs> where we paraded this whale skeleton in pieces down Front Street to the Maritime Museum, unloading it from one of the trucks into the museum. These are the lower jaws with all the fake teeth glued in place. We weighed every component before we installed it, just to get an idea of the final weight of this display. Reminding me and I'll tell you. <laughs> and Josh is putting the terminals on the cable that are used to support the display. That's what I just showed you, but you don't see it in the display, but that's what supports the whale. Bone doesn't support bone in that skeleton. Steel supports bone in that skeleton. We brought in a scissor lift and Paul is doing the rigging. <laughs> and the heart went on quite an adventure. Uh, it went from Cape Lookout to the freezer at our local NOAA lab and here in Beaufort. And then it went to the University of uh, Louisiana State University and up to University of Tennessee in Knoxville and to Raleigh, studied, taught, and ultimately plastinated, which is a process of replacing all the water soluble fluids in the cells with silicone, this real tissue. This, I won't pass this around, I 
glad to, but I just might bum or gross people out. This is the real aorta from this whale, plastinated. Back there is the real heart of the whale, plastinated. But the veterinarians wanted to cut this off so that you could look at that heart and see, I think, what's called the tricuspid valve. Is there a cardiologist in the house? <laughs> anyway, so you're welcome to handle that. And that's what's on display. So this literally fit right there. And you can see the four chambers and you can see the tendons and the ventricles, heart strings. There's an anatomical basis for the term heart strings. They tugged on my heart strings that refers to the tendons and the ventricles of a human heart, of course the heart cables in a whale. And in case you tend toward the geeky, a veterinarian helped me label the components. <laughs> All right. This is your final exam. This is October. Is there an October birthday in this group? Two. Would you mind stepping up here, both of you? <laughs> I, I, I have to pick on someone. I don't know a better way to do it. Okay. So you hold that too, please. And you hold this, I like your shirt. You wore that just for this present day. <laughs> okay, so they're holding teeth from sperm whales. Okay. Like the month after we installed this, another sperm whale came ashore in North Carolina. And this is it. And my wife went up to lead the necropsy. And she called me and said, Keith, it's a sperm whale. And I said, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> and she said, do you want it? And I said, no, <laughs> but will you grab a tooth for me? And she said, sure. sure. And, uh, and so I looked at my desk and I saw that I had the R10 tooth, right side, 10 from the front, and no tooth in the upper jaw. So I said, get me the R10 tooth, okay. So I've just shrunk that picture and put it up there. I'm gonna bring the picture of Echo here. You are holding Echo's, I think I blew it already, <laughs> R10 tooth. You are holding this whale's R10 tooth, okay? You see the difference? Which, why are they why are they so wildly different, the two teeth? One's older than the other. Male, female. Okay, male, female. I gotta give you both an A plus. Yes, one's well, one's older than the other, male, female. So whole, all right, so what I want you to think about is male, female. Which, Tooth, the tooth on your left or the tooth on your right is the male's tooth. Which one, this one, the male's tooth? And that's the females? You all are smarter than most people. Yeah, you're right. Like, you've heard my talk before, I recognize you. It's so neat to be able to demonstrate this with real material because a male gets much bigger than a female so everyone else I've ever presented this tooth, but that's a male tooth because it's big. But they're the same length. Both these two whales are 33 and a half feet long. At 33 and a half feet, a girl is an old lady. I got to be careful who I look at. And a, <laughs> and a boy is an adolescent. So we, we will have a, a smaller tooth, a less worn tooth, a hollow tooth. And yours is um, worn with erosion filled in. And so that, that just, that was my quiz. So for being good sports and having a birthday and admitting that you're having a birthday, you each get a re replica of one of those teeth. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. All right, wait. Yes. Um, Different colors, 
One's really fresh, the one on the right, Echo, and one is bloated and has been exposed to the sun a little longer. I think I'm almost through. Oh, yeah. Okay. So thanks for playing that game. Uh, just a few more slides. I want to emphasize that it takes money to do this. I'm not helping you. It's over. <laughs> but uh, we did this for about $50,000, and this is the budget that we wrote up. And my volunteers started a fundraiser where you could actually sponsor a tooth or a rib or a jaw or a skull. And they assigned a dollar value to each component. Um, and I didn't think it would work because you're going to pay money and get nothing. But we can't give away teeth or bones. And it worked. And they raised the $50,000 it took to do this project and install it here at the Maritime Museum based on that fundraiser. Shout out to all the volunteers who contributed to the project and all the organizations that they represented. And I've heard, I've seen it on Facebook, so it must be true. If you put a Protect Wild Dolphins license plate on your car, not only will your car go faster and last longer, uh, you'll look younger and sexier. And, and it's all good. No. Uh, that's the only funding we can count on on an annual basis. We get about ten to $14,000 a year from those of us who have these Protect Wild Dolphins license plates. You have to be a North Carolina driver. But it's a big help. And uh, friends in the North Carolina Maritime Museum is, are the recipients of that fund and it supports the work I presented today. There it is. Can you go back to that? Oh, that. That's to remind you to get one for your car. Oh, you're giving me goosebumps. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, that, that barn raising and the whole story that I presented to you inspired so many volunteers, they didn't want to lose the momentum. And they built Bonehenge 2, <laughs> which is at the Museum's Gallant Channel property. And I'm just going to show you four or five slides of that. It too was built by volunteers, and the general contract was a volunteer. So the two areas show you that's North Carolina Maritime Museum, the Bonehenge Whale Center, very close. It's about a mile, mile from here is the fish swims. Um, at the Gallant Channel property near the new bridge. So the site is in that red square. And that's the building built by volunteers. You can see with the new bridge and Gallant Channel in the background. There's the front of it. And it's not open for walk-ins. But I get all the texts and all the emails and all the phone calls, and I don't, I've hardly turned anyone down. I try to get anyone who wants to get in there to see it. Um, so all visits are by appointment, but there's a lot going on inside. It's a beautiful two-story building with a balcony and a, and, and a lot of projects going on, stories that are associated with each one. That's the Bonehead Whale Center. You made it. Thanks for your interest, and I'll stick around as long as anyone comes. Oh, thank you, the Lama Land. Um, I'm a child of the 60s, but there's nothing I can think of that describes and represents the theory that that huge oil reservoir and the sperm whale's head can actually be a buoyancy compensator, enabling that whale to die tremendous death with relative ease or surface. That is two liquids of slightly different density. The red gets warmed by the heat source, the light. The density changes and it floats until it cools. And then it sinks until it gets warm. And then it floats. And I can't think of anything that represents it better. And uh, it's believed that the whale can shunt warm air and warm blood from the core of its body to its spermaceti organ to manipulate the temperature, whether it does this thoughtfully or not may never be known, but that it contributes to uh, buoyancy for such a deep diver. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> and it's entertaining. Other questions or comments? 
Yes. Do they know what a typical heart rate is for external wells? Yes, the heart rate, and I don't know, but yeah, they, they, they're paying attention to the heart rate and how it changes with that. And some tags are being put on to help them get that. Yes. Why don't whales get the vents? They can. Some people believe they do, but they're less likely than the humans because they take air to the surface and it compresses at the same rate as other features in the whale's body. So unlike taking a sip of air at a depth, and that air expands as you rise, their air comes from the surface, shrinks as they go down, expands as they go up. Given that, they still get diving diseases. I'm not sure if it's called the bends or not, but they still get bubbles in their bloodstream and, and, and surfacing needs to be done. Um, I don't know if it's thoughtfully, but in a way that doesn't damage the whales because of a uh, pressure. But I think the simple explanation of why they're less susceptible is because they take air at the surface as opposed to a source like a scuba tank deep, which can be lethal to a human diver. Anyone knows more about diving than I speak of? Say that again. The dead ones, right? Yeah. Going to show the two whales side by side. Tongue and other mouth tissues. We see that periodically when a decomposed whale is bloating because of decomposition. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. How long can a whale stay under the water? Oh my. Let me tell you the extreme first, and this probably isn't typical, but and I hope I have this right. Both the Duke Marine Lab managed to um, put a couple of tags on goose-beaked whales, and they had exceeded any known diving depth for any other mammal, even sperm whales. And so I, the longest dive is around three hours. The depth was almost 10,000 feet. A uh, crazy deep, I don't think anyone will suggest humans know how they can pull that off and survive. So that's an extreme case. What's more normal is probably 2,000 feet, 3,000 feet. I think the record for sperm whales might be four or 5,000 feet, but what's normal is much less. But uh, the tags are getting pretty sophisticated so that we can actually figure out what they're doing down there. Presumably, they're not going, doing, going there to sleep. You know, they're looking for food and catching it. Yes. The question is different varieties of squid. Well, yes, there are different forms of squid. Some squid are actually vertical migrators, so they might be deep in the daytime and they come toward the surface at night. So, at the risk of oversimplifying, I'm not. I don't want to oversimplify. And I'll, I'll just say I don't know. The goose-beaked whales might be. We think they eat squid. We found squid and plastic in the stomachs. Um, and I think the folks that do think that they feed closer at the bottom. So, so there's some species that hang out deep. Some people have found divots in the sand in very deep water. And they're wondering what caused. And they're wondering if whales are groveling in the sediment for some sort of prey item. You have a lot to learn. Very hard to study. Yes. What ended up being the total weight of bunch? Oh, thanks for asking. You're paying attention. Um, 910 pounds. Like, that's with the seal. I was preparing for a 6,000 pound display. I couldn't believe how light it is. Yeah, deep divers send out more coarse bones. Uh, and of that 900 pounds, uh, fifteen uh, percent of it is steel, resin, bookbinder glue, and the rest is bone. All right. Yes. Information that you know. 
Oh, an author named Michael Moore wrote a paper about it. He's a veterinarian uh, at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And so he, um, he studies them in a while, but I guess he studies the tissues, the bones and the soft tissues of stranded ones. And so he is, his interpretation is that they are suffering from diving diseases, the bone density and other things. And some people think that um, human caused sound is causing whales to behave in a way that could be lethal. And this is, to, you know, in some part theoretical, that is forcing them to surface more quickly or leave an area more quickly and just out of fear but not being careful about their ascension. So he, he's curious, at least in the paper, he admitted, you know, why uh, these diseases are evident. In these deep diving whales. Um, but his name's Michael Moore. He happens to be the author of this book, We Are All Whalers. If you want to come up and uh, photograph the cover of the book, you'll know his name. And, uh, and uh, he's a really good guy. He sponsors my text messages. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's been fun. Thank you. <laughs>